Hello and welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy. Coming to you from our studios in Abuja, Amaupe Ogun Yusuf. Tonight, the Director General of the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, Julie Oka Donnelly, is our guest. And we're asking questions on how far with our quest to end modern slavery in Nigeria. Judy Okadonli, welcome to Hard Copy again. Thank you for having me again. Well, you were here in 2017, shortly after your appointment as Director General of NAPTIP. And then you were still fresh on the block. A number of things you were promising to investigate, to find out, to work with agencies. It's two years down the line. And I'm sure that, you know, there must be some progress report. Let me start with this one. Then we were downgraded by the United States uh, Department of State to a tier two watch list country. Uh, where are we? We're still on tier two watch list, aren't we? Yes, we are still on tier two watch list and um, we're hoping that we will go up the ladder a bit um, because a lot has happened since the last um, TIP report. The next Just TIP give me a moment. Sorry to interrupt you. Let me quickly uh, explain what that means to our viewers who are watching this. Now, for the sake of our viewers, uh, a tier two country, uh, countries whose government do not meet the TVPA, that's a Trafficking Victims Protection Act minimum standards, but are making significant efforts to bring themselves into compliance with those standards. Now, the tier two watch list countries, slightly different from the tier two country, the watch list country are countries whose governments do not fully meet the TVPA, that's the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, but are making significant efforts to bring themselves into compliance with those standards. But, or should I say and, the absolute number of victims of severe forms of trafficking is very significant or is significantly increasing. There is a failure to provide evidence of increasing efforts to combat severe forms of trafficking in persons from the previous year or the determination that a country is making significant efforts to bring itself into compliance with minimum standards was based on commitments by the country to take additional future steps over the next year. Well, they're trying to hold countries accountable, in essence. And it would seem that some of the criteria, we are not meeting them. That's why we're on the watch list right now, and we could be downgraded to Tier 3. I think only a few countries are on a special kit, Libya and Somalia. Uh, what progress have we made since we were initially listed on a tier two watch list? Well, so far so good. You know, the rating is a little bit complicated. It's more complicated than it appears. You know, when you say trafficking in persons, one expects that, you know, we are being graded on activities concerning trafficked persons, you know. But then other factors come in. Mm -hmm. Now they bring in factors like um, the army, for example, they claim that the army has got a lot of civilian JTFs mm. and they have little children who walk, you know, and as they, child soldiers. As child soldiers. That was and allegation. yes, that's the allegation. And that is trafficking. Mm -hmm. And um, they also have a lot of abuses going on in the IDP camps, mm -hmm. you know, where there's um, sex for food mm -hmm. and trafficking activities also take place in the ID camps. So they are alleged. So, I mean, this is not, you know, purely a naptive thing. So there are some things that we don't have control over. And so each of these um, agencies or law enforcement agencies, you know, have to deal with that. But the army has always repeatedly denied the fact that they don't have child soldiers with them. And not too long ago, UNICEF had even cleared that. UNICEF had confirmed that they were no longer child soldiers. So I hope that has been taken well, care of. Well, in 2017, of. while you were on the program, you did promise to see the Chief of Army staff. Well, I, I made an effort. I, I wrote, you know, for a courtesy call, and um, he's been very busy, you know. I think we keep missing each other. You know, I travel a lot, he travels a lot, and so we're not able to, we're not able to meet. But I'm sure something has been done about that aspect. It's been two years. Yes, the Nigerian Army, especially when you consider the charge, the Nigerian Army... I uh, would say that, well, we don't employ child soldiers, but the, the child is actually with the civilian JTF. Now, we know that the state government, uh, maybe with some support from the Nigerian Army, we don't know how much of a support, but the state government's usually in support of the civilian JTF. The civilian JTF are instrumental to the success of the Nigerian Army. 
Have you been able to meet with, say, the Borno State government? I've not been able to meet with him, you know, because of the um, situation, the security situation. You know, sometimes I want to go and then there's this story of bombings here and there and then, you know, we, we become a bit careful. But I've not been able to, but I am planning to go see him. It's on the table. What about commitment to funding? Because part of the problem then was also decreased funding for NAPTIP. Has that improved? Well, NAPTIP's funding has improved, but I don't think that should be really an issue because states should be responsible. Mm. You know, I expect that every state would have a role to play mm -hmm. in fighting human trafficking. It's not a federal government affair. States must be responsible because these people come from states. They are indigenous of various states. Mm -hmm. And that is why we started setting up task forces in all the states. We started with um, Delta and Ondo State, and we're just going to go on and on until we have task forces in all 36 states. So the, fed, the government, the state government, can own the project and begin to see himself as responsible for his indigents. What this report tells me is that a government of the United States, the government of the United States is very concerned about trafficking and uh, not just trafficking, ending modern slavery. They're taking strong steps and this includes holding other countries accountable. In our country, how high of the priority list would you say this issue of trafficking in persons is? I mean, considering just how many of our young people are affected, you say prevention is where you're focusing on. But you know, largely, would you say that that is high up the list of, you know, how high up the list of hierarchy of needs is that problem? Well, I think the political will of the federal government is there to stop human trafficking. The United States is not the only country that wants to end human trafficking or modern day slavery because even in the United States, human trafficking is very, very high, just like in every other country. It's a global problem. It's not a Nigerian problem, you know, and the federal government has a political way. That's where to start from. And we're doing a lot. So much has been done and so much is going to be done. It's a work in progress. It's not, it's not a one-off, but, but, but there are... There's a significant improvement, and I can assure you that we're definitely, Nigeria mm -hmm. is definitely going to go a step what higher. What are the indices for this improvement which you talk about? Okay, for example, now we have, the, 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 the cases of human trafficking has dropped significantly. We have less people trying to cross because of awareness. Back in the days, we never had reports like coming in to NAPTIP on phone, on um, the eye reporting and all of that. But now people are conscious. People just call and say, hey, something fun is going on around me, or there's this agent somewhere, something. You know, people are beginning to become aware. Even girls call us now and say, there's this guy that's been promising to take me abroad. I think you should check him out. But it never happened before. So it, it has really, it, it is really reducing because we are going to the border communities to sensitize people, and they are like, yes. We are watching people and, you know, it's reducing. And people are now moving and finding different ways of doing it. People are becoming more aware. For example, back in the days, they had this oath swearing ceremony before they shipped the children or, or women or men out of Nigeria. But now they've taken it out because when you tell someone, we're going to swear an oath, you know, it sends a red flag. And they're like, hey, wait a minute, something is not right here. So now they've taken this oath swearing to the destination countries where you are stuck and you, ha you cannot run away, you don't have a choice. So, you know, a lot of things are changing. Mm. And I so think it would look like the modus operandi is changing. Yes, it's not it's necessarily that trafficking is on the decrease. No, it is on the decrease because more people are aware now. More people, but of course, the unfortunate people. You know, you can't sensitize the whole country all at once because these criminals go into the rural communities where there's little or no access to the social media, you know. So people are not aware. They don't have TV sets. They don't really know what's going on. I'll tell you something. I went to Mali, and I saw this very young, beautiful girl, maybe like 14 or 13, from Ibadan, or your state. I mean, she, 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 she obviously came from the deep rural communities. What they do is when they see people are becoming aware, they go into the nooks and crannies of communities where there's little or no nothing, you know, 
going on, you know, and, and that's what they do. They keep moving. They keep moving. They keep moving. But as they are moving, we are also moving. And people are becoming more aware. And that's, that's just the but way it is. How are you is. measuring the statistics of, the, of those who have been moved to other countries? Because you say that in the countries, I mean, the, the countries where they are moved to, the numbers of people being trafficked are decreasing. How are you able to tell that? For example, in Italy, numbers have dropped. Number of Nigerians? Number of Nigerians in Italy now, going into Italy, have dropped significantly. So we are told by the Italian authorities, number of going, those going into Spain, France, and so many other countries like that has dropped significantly. And we believe that the awareness, people are getting more and more aware, even you, in the marketplaces now. You think it's only about awareness? Only recently, uh, we had a situation, I think channels did a report in Edo State, where returnees from Libya, not all of them, as you have clarified in the past, are trafficked persons. Some of them are people who went uh, to these countries voluntarily. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but in the wake of the crisis in Libya, we've seen a number of people return. I think uh, at the last count, over 40,000 people were reported, 40,000 Nigerians were reported to have been repatriated voluntarily back to Nigeria. Um, and we now hear that some of them are saying they would like to go back to Libya because it looks like the conditions here in Nigeria uh, I don't know, die as they might have seen in Libya, uh, the conditions here, I don't know, don't seem to favor them. No, you know, like I said earlier in one of the interviews, anyone who has gone through that trauma and says he or she wants to go back mm -hmm. has to be examined. They most likely have a psychological problem, trust me, because no one in his or her right senses would call to lead Libya and want to go back to Libya. I have been there, so I'm giving you first-hand information. A lot of people that come back have psychological problems, and that is why the first thing we do is to offer them psychosocial support. Psychosocial support is not a one-off thing. It's not a two, three-day, four thing. You have to follow them up aggressively until you are sure that they are back in their right senses. So trust me, those who are saying they are going back definitely have to get themselves re-examined, if that is if they were examined in the first place. They need help. But you have been working with state governments, and some people say it's because people don't have things to do here. Uh, that our youths are idle. Let me take a state in point. The Edo state government initially, can you quickly tell us about that? Initially, we seen that there was a row between yourself and the state government in, in, in Edo, but has that been resolved? We have a very good relationship. I, I'm not sure there was a row per se. Mm -hmm. I, as the dep I, I, as the Director General of NAPTIP, mm -hmm. wanted those who had set up a task force, and Edo State had set up a task force, they were the first to set up a task force, to do the right thing. And what is the right thing in this context? The right thing is to ensure that before you go and back on a rehabilitation process, you must have a shelter. But at the time, they did not have a shelter. I think they are trying to build a shelter now. Edo State did not have a shelter at the time. And the question was, how do you expect to rehabilitate the victims who have re been returned back because they are likely to go back again? The first thing is to shelter them. There's the protocol for rehabilitation. First of all, you must put them in shelters, then give them psychosocial support. Mm -hmm. After psychosocial support, you now rehabilitate and empower them. You just said they were likely to go back. Why would they go back? Because of the... Because the, there's nowhere for them to stay. Or because of Most the of them sold faced. their properties. Mm -hmm. Most of them are down, you know, like some kind of ill ailments. Most of them have psychological problems. So they need to be kept in a shelter where they will be given all these services before you can succeed in empowering them. That was it. But now we've, we've, we've sorted it out because we need each other. We mm -hmm. need to work with each other. I paid the Edo State Governor a courtesy call a few days ago. Um, we went on our visits to Delta and Ondo to set up the task forces. So we trained the task force of Edo State, and then we went ahead to inaugurate Ondo State, Delta State, and also trained the task forces. Well, we're going to also ask, how big is this problem of organ harvesting? Uh, in 2017, the DG had promised to investigate uh, issues of ritual murders where people thought that this uh, were just done for, you know, rituals in Nigeria. She said she thought it was about organ harvesting. What investigations and inroads have been able to make in that regard? In just a moment, please stay with us.
Welcome back. You're watching Hard Copy coming to you from our studios in Abuja. The Director General of the National Agency for the Prohibition of, Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, Julie Okadonley, is our guest. And we're asking questions along the lines of ending modern slavery in Nigeria. Let's quickly talk about, you know, the ritual murders, which you said in 2017 you suspected uh, were cases of organ harvesting. Was that really the case? Well, I want to believe it's the case because still we have problems where murders where body parts are taken out are ruled by the police as ritual murders. What I've told my investigation officer that he needs to reach out to the investigators for us to have a joint investigation. But you know, sometimes it's not that easy to have law enforcement agencies come together to have joint operations. But I've, I've written to the Inspector General, and, and, and I'm sure he will meet with me because he, he holds NAPTIP in very high esteem. Two years down the line, you haven't been able to find that out? Uh, it's, not, um, it's not as easy as it sounds, but um, we'll get there and very soon because last week we had a management meeting mm -hmm. and I brought this up again. I brought this up and I told my um, director of investigation that he had to reach out to the commissioner of police and tell him that we have to start to have joint investigations on ritual murders because I have cause to believe there's more to it mm. than meets the eye. Well, uh, how would you say people are responding to this um, idea of prevention? Uh, do you think that young people are responding or do you think that the demographics, you say that it is reducing, but do you think that the demographics of those who still want to travel, who still believe that the grass is greener on the other side, um, are still quite large? It's quite large because there's a very big problem. There's a new dimension, a new trend where religion has been brought into this. Mm. We have people who deceive young girls and boys that they want to send them for pilgrimage to either Mecca or Jerusalem. And when people hear pilgrimage, they're excited. Then we have these um, travel agencies now who go into the rural areas again and bring these young girls and tell them that they're going to get jobs as housemaids in the Holy Land in Saudi Arabia and they take them there and of course the rest is history we know what's going on with them most of them are trafficked we get calls, distress calls every day from girls like this being trafficked. But the people are saying that, you know, NAPTIP should be a little more, uh, what's the word now, proactive. If you know this thing, shouldn't you have a desk at the airports, for uh, instance? Un unfortunately, we are not allowed to be at the airports. I brought this up severally mm -hmm. on the need and importance for NAPTIP to be at the airports and at the borders. But we were told that the ease of doing business would not allow NAPTIP to be at the airports or at the borders. And I will still continue to push until we are allowed to stay at the airports and at the borders. Reason being that those at the airports and the borders don't have trafficking as their core mandate. So they are, they are definitely going to, you know, to concentrate on their core mandate. Mm. But NAPTIP's core mandate is to stop all types of human trafficking. And so if they have NAPTIP officials at the airports, we will definitely stop human trafficking. Not that you, the, another ring will be created. I mean, because definitely there will be reasons why, you know, desks will have to be reduced at the airport. Why is the Nigerian immigration, uh, they're not buying in on what it is that you're doing? Well, I, I cannot speak for the Nigerian immigration services, mm -hmm. but I know we have, we are collaborating in the fight against human trafficking. We have a good relationship. Um, the Controller General and I are on good terms, um, and we're both trying to see what we can do to ensure that we bring it to the barest minimum. But like I said before, that is not their core mandate. Mm -hmm. And so it is important that NAPTIP is stationed at the airports and at the seaports and at the borders. And I can assure you, if that happens, you will see a drastic drop in the number of girls who are trafficked to the Middle East. Collaboration, it was seem, is a major issue that you're facing. I mean, you've talked about the Nigerian army, 
you've not been able to see the chief of army staff, sadly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, regardless of the fact that, you know, you have this problem on your hands and trying to raise uh, Nigeria's tier level and compliance, so to speak. Uh, number two, you've not been able to see the inspector general of police. Yes, we know that a number of them have been changed. Uh, the immigration service, you say you have a good working relationship with the uh, DG, but CG, yeah. the CG, the controller general. Uh, how significant or how important is it for your office to have a good working interpersonal relationship for there to be collaboration at the level of institution? It's extremely important, you know, for NAPTIP to have a very good relationship with all the law enforcement agencies and relevant stakeholders because there must be synergy, there must be cooperation, and there must be coordination. Are you feeling that at all? I'm, I'm not feeling it the way I want to feel it. And that's why I'm reaching out to the law enforcement agencies and trying to tell them because the problem is some, you know, some uniformed services think they are superior and, oh, I can't take instructions from the DG of NAPTIP. And I tell them, you're not taking instructions from the DG of NAPTIP. All we are doing is working together for the good of Nigeria and Nigerians generally. So, you know, you, ne you need to keep giving them that assurance that this is not a superiority um, test. This is just... This is just the way it should be. We must come together, work very closely together, cooperate together, synergize, and coordinate. Because if everyone is doing their thing, it won't work. And I think um, I'll get there. Because even on Monday, the Comptroller General of Immigration Services is paying me a custody call in my office. Mm. Yes, and that would very be another good avenue for us to, you know. I'd like to show you optimism, but, you know, as we move along, and I sincerely hope that I would not, I mean, this, this story would not, be, would not continue to be the case. But let's quickly talk about this ECOWAS National Biometric Card. You have been, you know, going along, is it with the immigration now? What have you found out along your, your cause of sensitization across uh, the ECOWAS region in terms of trafficking? What have you found in the major motor parks? What is the story? Trafficking is huge through the borders. We went to mile two bus stop mm -hmm. to sensitize the transporters. We went to the Semakre, Semakrake border. We went to the Togo, Ghana border. We went to Kotonou and we had a meeting with the transporters. We had a meeting with the law enforcement agencies or agents that man the borders. Um, the problem, they seem to misconstrue or misinterpret the ECOWAS protocol on free movement to mean that anyone can just go through the borders as long as you're, in, you're, you're a West African and you're going to a West African country without valid documentation or for no reason. And so when these unaccompanied minors or young girls are going through the borders, they say, yes, ECOWAS protocol on free movement. And so I was very excited to be part of the team with the IOM and ECOWAS to go and sensitize them that the protocol does not mean you will not have a valid ID card. Mm. Some people cannot afford the international passports, but this ID card is going to enable everyone to go through, but for documentation purposes. I understand that we're yeah. totally out of time, but just quickly, do you think this ID card is going to help end trafficking? Will it make any difference? It will help because, I mean... Everyone, you, all your details are there. So you're able to take records of who is going out, who is coming in. And of course, it will make people now begin to understand better. You can't go there. What are you going there for? You know, mm. go back and all of that. So they will take it more seriously because now they just don't care. Let us see how that goes. But Julie Okadoni, thank you for coming on Hard Copy tonight. Thank you for having me once more. Well, that's the program tonight. Do you think an app can win the war against human trafficking? Your views and comments are welcome to the address showing on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Mao Kwe Ogun Yusuf. Good night.